Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at ExpressVPN. Do you get worried about, you know, being spied on? Look, I'm gonna judge you on the internet. Neither should your ISP. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, in today's day and age, having a VPN is all but a necessity. Do you want to mask your digital location from weird people on the internet? Well, with ExpressVPN's numerous servers, you too can mask your location with very high quality, high fast speed servers all over the world. Do you want to maybe, for instance, hide your information from your ISP like I mentioned earlier? Well, with no lock technology and trusted server connections, ExpressVPN assures me, along with several third-party high-quality audits, that you are absolutely safe from being logged because ExpressVPN operates their servers through RAM-based methods, meaning that everything you do in their session is effectively wiped as soon as the RAM gets cleared, meaning that there's no hard drives that are keeping your information on there, cached potentially. And is one of the many reasons why I personally use ExpressVPN alongside just having pretty fast speeds. I think that's very important in a VPN when I'm downloading and browsing high, uh, you know, bandwidth stuff on the internet day in and day out. And without sounding like a broken record, if you want to experience a logless world like I do, check out expressvpn.com SOG and get an extra three months of ExpressVPN all for free. Ladies and gentlemen, that is expressvpn.com SOG. That said, let's get on to the video. North Korea is one of my favorite topics, as you all know on this channel, ladies and gentlemen. From time to time, I'll always end up covering their malware, watching their computer operating systems like Red Star OS, playing games from the Hermit Kingdom, even if they are just Flash titles, and sometimes my favorite is looking at their propaganda channels all over YouTube, TikTok, Dailymotion, whatever. Whether it's Google mapping the mansions of Pyongyang, I still to this day will constantly reiterate that this kingdom gets away with a lot more than they should. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're looking at the 2017 assassination of Kim Jong-un's half-brother, Kim Jong-nam. Quite a bit departure from my regular content, but generally I like to look at situations like this because for me, I'm always surprised that nobody really talks about this as much. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was a huge topic of discussion when it happened. But this is one of those things where generally the times that I bring this up to people, it's always like, oh wow, that happened. But in reality, this is a period where North Korea released a weapon of mass destruction out into the world just to assassinate another dissenter. So North Korea has always been a land of secrecy for anybody who wants to know. Getting any information out of there is effectively downright impossible. They control every single thing that they show through their various channels, and they control all travel into the country, and anytime you even get to be part of the annual tours they host, it's all highly curated displays of whatever progress they want to show, that they're actually so desperate to showcase the rest of the world that they're actually on par with some of the bigger players. From time to time, North Korea keeps popping up in headlines and the world stage whenever they reach some new landmark in their nuclear weapons program, basically throwing an extra couple missiles into the Sea of Japan. And then of course, in recent times, when an American soldier literally raced across the DMZ for whatever reason, and uh, now it's become a whole international conflict. Travis King, 48 days spent time in a South Korean prison before bolting across the border all the way to the north. Apparently, private second-class Travis King spent 48 days in a prison in Shonan, a city 50 miles south of the South Korean capital, Seoul, after he failed to pay a $4,000 fine on charges that included damaging public property. I have to imagine there's something far serious if it means he runs across the line of control all the way in the North Korean waters. I have to imagine the actual punishment he would have faced from the United States wouldn't be as bad as what he's facing right now in North Korea, possibly if it comes down to even rescuing him out of there or getting him out of the country to begin with. Anyways, totally different story. Let's get back to the meat of this video. In reality, North Korea is an incredibly poor country. The average person makes an entirely unlivable wage, even if all of their amenities are supposed to be paid, quote unquote, where they make a few thousand dollars throughout the course of the year, while the richest person in the entire country spends every waking day skewing the obesity average, gets to live the most opulent luxury imaginable, the best wine, the best food, the best cars, and the ability to get away with literal murder. And now Kim Jong-il, the father of Kim Jong-un, had a few consorts, a estranged wife, 
But most importantly, one of his children's, Kim Jong Nam, actually ended up being a pretty normal guy. And a pretty normal guy with an incredible death wish because he spent a good chunk of his life towards the tail end, ostracized from his family, criticizing the dynasty, and the horrors they unleashed upon their own people. He described Kim Jong Un as quote unquote, a joke to the outside world. One statement that I wholeheartedly agree with. Now, of course, this was all coming out in a book by uh, Yuji Gomi, a Japanese journalist who actually communicated with Kim Jong Nam for over seven years through emails. And in those emails, Nam was critical of the regime so far to the point where he was actually talking about its future implosion. Now, Kim Jong Nam, for anybody following the history of North Korea at one point, was the actual heir apparent. And while he had been exiled before his dad's actual death, when he was younger, he attended Kim Il Sung University, and he actually got a senior post at the Ministry of Public Security. He was in charge in the very early 2000s and the late 90s for the country's burgeoning IT industry. And at a time, he even went with his dad to Shanghai to discuss their IT industry as well, too. But four months after going to Shanghai, he was arrested in Tokyo's Narita Airport using a forged passport, no less, alongside two women and a four-year-old. During interrogations, he literally said he wanted to go to the Tokyo Disneyland. Now, because of this, his father had to actually cancel a trip to China and be publicly embarrassed in front of the world. This embarrassment was so bad that he was effectively exiled to Macau, and he had to say he had no plans to ever defect North Korea. No, 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 no. And of course, he also had no interest in leading the nation of North Korea. Now, of course, I'm not trying to make a biopic on the guy over here, right? This is not supposed to be the Oppenheimer for him. Ladies and gentlemen, all you need to know was that specifically. This wasn't some child that came out of wedlock and, you know, the Kim Jong, Kim Jong family was trying to necessarily hide. For a brief period, if cards were played in a different way, he was groomed to effectively be the leader of the Hermit Kingdom. Now, to understand, this guy was poking the bear. Like many anti-North Korean dissenters and people very critical of the regime, they end up becoming targets. And it isn't until they actually end up getting some sort of political power or a following that the North Korean government may actually choose to execute these people. It doesn't even have to even be a dissenter. Sometimes the North Koreans are so brazen that they launch an attack literally against their rival country's uh, place of residence for their president. So imagine if a country attacked the White House, effectively what happened back in 68. North Koreans sent elite commandos over the uh, border all the way to the Blue House, which was effectively the presidential home for you know the president at the time. And uh, you know they left one fatal error, they kept a few people alive and you know if they hadn't they might have maintained their stealth and actually assassinated a president at the time so yeah uh, it led to a pretty bloody battle at the actual blue house and it was one of the lowest points for the relationship between north and south but it's an example to show you that these people are incredibly unpredictable if they want you dead they will try any james bond trick that they can but to rein it back in let's look at the cctv footage of the day the assassination happened for kim jong nam the CCTV footage that you're seeing right over here is Kim Jong-un walking through this airport alone, unattended. Two attackers, in a matter of minutes, well, scratch that, seconds, appear to wipe his face with a napkin. And then they're seen quickly exfiltrate. Kim Jong-nam is then seen speaking to security officers, telling them of the incident. If you look real closely, the police report that he was feeling dizzy, and of course, as he's describing this entire event, the two officers here even start stepping back. Of course, he then gets escorted to a medical clinic within the actual airport, where shortly after he starts having seizures, and then he's actually escorted into an ambulance to go to a hospital. During this period, he ends up dying. All of this happened in less than 20 minutes, and that's of course because of the amount of dosage that was actually administered. So how did he die? Well, through a weapon known as VX serum, VX nerve agent. Now this is of course a weapon of mass destruction, which of course, as you can imagine, is also banned under the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention, meaning that this isn't even something that you're allowed to use for war. So outlawed, in fact, that the United States has actually disarmed uh, its entire supply of VX nerve agents and missiles, uh, if we're to believe, of course, you know, that statement. And also it's so potent that just producing and stockpiling uh, above 100 grams of it is enough for it to be internationally illegal.
legal. I believe uh, you're only allowed to use a certain quantity if you're using it for very specific research purposes. Now, nerve agents are known primarily as organic chemicals that disrupt the way nerves transfer messages to your organs. Primarily, they work by causing the blockage of acetylcholinesterase, which I hope I pronounced that one right, I ain't a doctor, but nerve agents act incredibly quickly and usually you'll see the first symptoms within seconds, seconds of exposure. In the next few minutes, it's likely when you're about to die through either asphyxiation or cardiac arrest. And of course, typically these agents are odorless and tasteless and whether or not you get hit by sarin, VX, Taboon, or Silmon, these are all nerve agents, your death will be quick and definitely painful. Let's not forget that part. So VX, also known as Venomous Agent X, yeah, it sounds like a real, real spooky virus. To understand, out of all nerve agents imaginable, VX is the most potent. And the way that it works is effectively penetrating the skin on your body. So the amount you really need to actually kill somebody is scarily low. Literally just a drop of it can kill you within minutes. So doses smaller than that, smaller than the drop really, can cause eye pain, vomiting, and blurred vision if you're actually lucky in this case. So because it goes through the skin, you can effectively put it into a vapor form, a spray, or even, again, in this case, dabbed onto a napkin. And of course, if it's inhaled or ingested, like I said, it, the symptoms can show up in seconds and the death can come in minutes. Now, what's even scarier about this is this can survive on clothing for up to 30 minutes, meaning that if that napkin right, the, the combination on the body. Let's say, for example, any of that vapor, any of that like material stuck onto clothing, fabric, maybe even like, you know, on the side of like a wall, somebody else could touch that and then they could start dying too. It could have went from one kill, one carefully planned kill in an assassination to 10 kills, to 15. And remember the, how crowded the Kuala Lumpur airport actually is. So shortly after the attack, four people were arrested. So Siti Aisha, who is the Indonesian woman who was arrested of, uh, accused basically of wiping that VX nerve on Nam's face. Then the other person who wiped another fluid on uh, Nam's face, Don Ti Hong, a woman who was believed to be on that CCTV footage, the one wearing the white shirt actually grabbing Nam's face and wiping uh, the the nerve agent right there. Ri Jong Shol, who is a North Korean who is believed to be a chemistry expert, also worked as an IT contractor for a company known as Tombo Enterprises in Malaysia. So he was let go because there was a lack of evidence. However, in his case, he even accused the Malaysian government of using coercive tactics to force a confession. To this day, six wanted people remain out of the situation. Kim Uk Il, a North Korean who worked for the state airline, Air Koryo is one that is believed to be one of the masterminds of this entire operation. Malaysia issued an arrest warrant, but this person disappeared less than a month after the actual attacks. The four other people were captured on CCTV footage, uh, flying on regular passports. These individuals are Ri Ji Hyun, Hong Song Hak, Oh Jong Gil, and Ri Jai Na who were all suspected to be perpetrators and handlers in this entire situation. So as the VX nerve agent was applied, it was alleged that these people were basically handlers sitting from far away, monitoring these two women. And of course, as soon as this VX nerve agent was applied, they would then grab flights and fly out of the airport where they wouldn't be caught. They would basically be out and free. The final person in the situation, Ri Ji U, is actually still believed to be in Malaysia, just hiding away, but probably at this point, way out of the country. So in the wake of the attacks, the relations between Malaysia, North Korea, and to an extent even Indonesia, basically dissoluted. When the ambassador, Kang Shoal, was expelled as the North Korean embassy actually demanded no autopsy take place. Believe it or not, the drama that ensued after the autopsy was happening and during the actual assassination, once the dead body was there, the government of North Korea, the embassy in specific, actually tried to hamper the investigation to, like, to no end. Now the two women in this case were actually, who were arrested, had no idea of the attack as they claimed. So Siti Aisha basically claimed that she was actually duped into committing this because she thought that she was part of some elaborate TV prank, okay, some TV prank show. And she was just filming pranks, again, at the airport, which should have been a red flag to her and anybody. 
why you would think you could film pranks at an airport, which are some of the most secure locations in the world. Obviously, if you remember a small event known as 9-11, airport security internationally is treated very carefully. You are not allowed to goof at an airport. If you're out there spreading like, what? if you leave a water bottle unattended, if you just leave any baggage unattended, airport security treats that very seriously. If you're at any airport and you wipe a liquid on somebody's face, they will detain you. They will assume that you are a terrorist, a biological terrorist, if you are doing any of that kind of shit. The last thing you ever want to do at an airport is a meme, a joke, a prank. There are YouTube pranksters that will not go that far to go out to an airport and start pranking there because they know the amount of actual damage that they can do to themselves legally, financially. Hell, they might even be sent to a black site if they decide to go do some crazy shit in an airport. Now, I would believe that to be the red flag, but according to her lawyer, she was paid 4,000 Malaysian ringgit, which actually converted to around 1,000 US dollars at the time. She claimed she was hired by some North Korean to fly to Macau, where Kim Jong-nam was already staying, all right? That's their home base. All she knew was that this was a reality TV program where she had to play some harmless pranks, and the show ended up being canceled for, you can imagine, obvious reasons. Five days before the assassination, she told her friends that she was going to Macau for a film shoot. Both these women basically believed uh, in their testimonies that like the other people, the missing North Koreans that got away with this, were all their handlers the entire time, watching them, monitoring them, and as soon as they wiped uh, Kim Jong-nam's face with a VX nerve agent, they just flew off on their separate ways. The operation was done. And again, it's scary how that, how quick the assassination took place. I'm not joking when I said all of this took place in less than 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, the North Korean government killed one of their biggest dissenters, but also released a actual weapon of mass destruction, a biological weapon of mass destruction that they are lucky as all hell, nobody else ended up ever getting harmed through this entire process. Huang was a different story as well too, which is an individual that actually had to do a bit more jail time and actually did get a bunch of charges, uh, well, pleaded down to a charge, still had to actually admit guilt. This is an individual that had come in on a Vietnamese passport, so again, Vietnamese national, and was located at a hotel near the airport just days before. And according to the receptionist at the hotel, she booked the cheapest room imaginable and had a wad of cash on her. What's being implicated here is some really fishy behavior. She stayed at another hotel as well, and during the period leading up to the attack, there was a brief moment of time where all of her actions remain unaccounted for. So after Nam had died, even the autopsy, like I said, had its fair share of drama. According to the Malaysian police, even the morgue where the body was held had multiple attempts of actual break-ins, as they claim. The police constantly made requests to the embassy for questions and comments, and they either kept getting ignored, the relations between both countries deteriorated so quickly that to this day, they remain non-existent. North Korea severed ties due to, again, uh, the extradition of one of their nationals to the United States by Malaysia, and the Malaysian government declared every North Korean diplomatic staff persona non grata. So at the time of the actual assassination shortly after, the North Korean embassy literally requested the Malaysian government not to deliver an autopsy to release their citizens, the North Korean nationals, and they even actually said the two women arrested uh, were, at least as far as they claimed, innocent in this entire scheme. Rather interesting for the North Korean government to do. So the two women interested me initially. Why would these guys hire more than one woman? Why would they try to get two? Wouldn't that add more risk? And again, according to experts in regards to the VX agent, the way that they dispersed this was using a binary chemical system meaning that they gave half of the compound to one of the girls and they gave half the compound to the other girl. And so when you rub the compound together, that would create the VX agent that would actually kill Nam. So there's a few reasons you would actually go about and do this. One of them is actual safety. <laughs> I know that's a bit ironic. The reason why you do it is none of the parties die trying to deliver the VX agent. Because again, it's very deadly in small doses. And you can imagine when you're, in an, when, you, when you're using it on a napkin, your skin is still connected. And from what I've seen, none of these girls appear to be wearing any gloves. So when one of the girls applies the actual like, uh, you know, liquid on Danam's face, that's half of the agent. 
Then the other girl would come in, apply the other half, and then the VX would form, and that would kill Nam. The other reason you would actually end up doing this is to smuggle the actual material in. See, smuggling actual VX serum may get caught on a radar, but smuggling individual components, you know, kind of like doing the old KFC secret recipe strategy of like having half of the material here, half of the material there, would be a little bit easier for, in terms of smuggling reasons, okay? That might be the only case you would look into it. Again, because this is odorless, because it's tasteless, this unfortunately is, from what I've been reading, very, very easy to smuggle around. Creating it is a different story. So again, the VX agent wasn't actually as deadly as some experts claim, because what they had seen in the CCTV footage when Nam was actually given the VX agent, he could walk without spasms, paramedics actually seemed to be okay interacting with him, and even the assailants in this case survived. However, C.D. Aisha actually claimed that she was vomiting in the taxi when she was leaving, and of course she still feels unwell to this day. The reason the experts say is because the actual uh, chemicals used to create the VX serum the North Koreans used was actually less potent because the actual chemicals used to produce it were, you know, several years old. So again, you know, the world kind of got lucky on that part. This was a slightly less dangerous weapon of mass destruction. Now, initially both the women were charged because it seemed like they were the ones that were responsible for the murder. But it became apparent that the uh, that their alibi of a prank TV show actually made sense. By the end of the actual decision, the video evidence proved that their mannerisms weren't actually in line with somebody handling dangerous VX nerve agents because it really did appear that these women had no idea the dangerous shit that they were carrying around. But again, the courts weren't as receptive initially. There was a moment where the courts even alleged these women that they were trained assassins. Since it was claimed that they went to the bathroom shortly after, basically it was alleged that they knew how to like clean themselves the VX agent. Um, but again, prosecutors even appear to say that this didn't seem like a prank because uh, the women actually ended up going into this with a uh, element of aggressiveness, meaning that it wasn't just a prank where like you wipe some napkin across somebody's face. They were literally getting into the eyes, eyelids, faces, everything. They were going above and beyond what they needed to do for a thousand dollar prank TV like filming. But again, these women were, uh, you know, ultimately their murder charges were taken away. Even the Indonesian government had to get involved with a former letter to Malaysia requesting the release of CD at the time. And of course, Sidi was released, but Huang was also released later on, but she had to, she was supposed to spend around three years and four months in prison. But she, you know, pleaded lesser to voluntarily causing hurt for, by dangerous weapons or means. And she also got out with a one third reduction in her prison sentence. Now, Kim Jong Nam flew under the alias known as Kim Shol, who basically had four passports from North Korea and would lend North Korean agents to effectively track this man's activities down and create this assassination attempt was looking at his use of Facebook under that alias. And of course, his interactions with several high profile email services. It made tracking him that much easier. And of course, alongside those passports, it was interesting to know that he even carried with him at the time, $100,000 in cash. Why? I don't know. I also know traveling with that much money can get you into some serious trouble at an airport. Why take that risk? Well, who knows? Now, of course, you might be wondering, man, Muto, what is the actual response from the world that North Korea decides to bring VX nerve agents to one of the biggest airports in the world? And sadly, not too much. I mean, to understand diplomatic relationships soured between North Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea said it was a naked example of Kim Jong-un's reign of terror. The United States literally relisted North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism. They imposed even further sanctions on North Korea at the time. North Korea actually did offer an apology informally to, guess who? Vietnam for their use of one of their nationals in a actual assassination schemes. To be honest, the only thing that was interesting that came out of it was the possibility, the actual allegation, that Kim Jong-nam may have been a CIA asset or a source. Now, this might actually lead credence as to why North Korea decided to go after him in the first place, if this is true, because that would mean he is not only a traitor to the country, but he can actually pose a serious risk to the regime if he's providing classified information to the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States. So where did this rumor come out from? 
Well, Anna Feifeld, a bureau chief for the Washington Post in Beijing. She actually claimed that apparently there is surveillance footage of uh, Kim Jong-nam going into like a, a lift where he met with another Asian person that's presumably like a U.S. intelligence officer. And of course, at that moment in time, they were he was sharing like information and he even had like a backpack of cash that totaled up to 120 grand at the time. So apparently it was either like the CIA paying him off for information, which by the way, that's a massive payoff, but it's also a really massive allegation. And of course, the answer to this is, uh, there is no actual source or CCTV footage that we can watch. These are, again, just allegations as part of Anna's book. Now, in the end, the assassinations seem to be a very long time coming, and it's a showcase of how evil the regime truly is. Again, he was always a thorn in the government's side. He was always a thorn in his half-brother's side. And with the allegation that he might be a CIA source, again, purely an allegation, this led to create this led to an obvious like understanding that if anybody's going to get assassinated it's this guy now what's really sad about this is no matter how much you sanction North Korea what's really a situation here is this is not the only assassination they're ever going to do the reality is just by slapping them on the wrist a million times it's never really a solution I'm also not one to say you should just invade a nuclear equipped country, that's not really the case whatsoever, but the way that this regime acts and the amount of bullshit they get away with would make any criminal hardened over the course of years. It would make any criminal excited if they could actually get away with a literal like biological terrorism like this. North Korea is literally getting worse as time goes on. I mean, just the other day, they were throwing nuclear weapons around. They, they literally have a nuclear weapons program that at one point was a joke, but now poses an incredibly serious threat to our various allies around the world. Hell, give them a couple more years and they could strike any target here, as scary as that sounds. And in my opinion, the more tyrannical this regime gets and the worse it gets with the newer people that come into line, the more radicalized individuals in North Korea, at some point, Point, they're gonna need a bit more than a slap on the wrist. But this is a story of how one of the most interesting assassination plots in modern history has ever happened. North Korea literally, without even thinking twice, released a biological weapon of mass destruction to kill a dissenter. If that sounds extreme to you, I'll be real with you, man. The world is a lot scarier than any fiction and media you read. Literally in the Kuala Lumpur airport that day, you know, if things had went even slightly wrong, there could have been a lot of death, a lot of scary shit. And you know, maybe that might have been the catalyst for the world governments to truly drop the hammer on these guys. But for now, North Korea literally operates with impunity. And I know I laugh at it sometimes, but these are kind of the stories that make me truly like chilled out to the bottom of my core. And I really hope that something happens because this kind of shit just can't keep going on. But ladies and gentlemen, Hopefully you were interested by today's video. If you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. I am out.